Welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast, interdisciplinary conversations about new works in the broad world of business research. I'm your host, Andrew Jennings. If you like what you hear today, please consider subscribing to the podcast or sharing with others who might like it too. And if you have ideas for future episodes, let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Our guest today is Natasha Sarin, Assistant Professor of Law at the University of Pennsylvania School of Law and Assistant Professor of Finance at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. We'll be discussing her recent article, Making Consumer Finance Work, which was forthcoming in the Columbia Law Review. I'll add a link to the article in the show notes for today's episode. Natasha, welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited. In your article, Making Consumer Finance Work, you examine a few policy interventions after the 2008 global financial crisis in the consumer finance markets, one as it relates to credit cards, one relating to overdrafts, and another to debit cards. Could you discuss the historical background of these interventions? What do these policies provide? What were consumer advocates hoping to achieve with them? And what are some of the warnings that banks and others in the the financial industry made in terms of what the unintended consequences of these policies might be? So that's a great set of questions. And just to orient us a little bit, I was very lucky because I've been interested in financial regulation and consumer finance for a long time. And I had the opportunity to work at the White House at the National Economic Council, uh, sort of on drafting Dodd Frank in the immediate aftermath of the crisis. And so these kinds of questions about how to protect consumers in financial markets were weighing quite heavily on us at the time. But that's not to say that people didn't realize that there were problems in these markets before. It was a little bit that, and this is what Rahm Emanuel said at the time, that you shouldn't let a good crisis go to waste. And so basically, we had all of this energy and political capital to kind of use to think about how best to reform financial markets and how to better do financial regulation, which meant both like macro prudential, you know, like bank capital requirements, how to get rid of some of the like too big to fail problems that were at the forefront of the crisis. But it also meant how do we make these markets work better for regular people and regular people who had been really quite badly harmed by the recession that we were all still living through? You know, one in 10 Americans was unemployed during the recession. Nine million people lost their homes. Many consumers went into substantial debt without having realized even that they were going to be able to rack up these sort of levels of credit because no one, not even you, not I, no one in the real world reads the credit card contracts that they get from their lenders, reads the sort of checking account, fine print of the checking account contract decision that they form with their bank. And so these are relationships where on the one side, consumer finance is incredibly interesting for so many reasons. But one of them is that on the one side, you have like really sophisticated kind of profit maximizing, intelligent, run by high flying executives whose compensation depends essentially on how well they are able to encourage consumers to take advantage of products with which might not necessarily be the best for them. And that's these banks. And then you have regular people who are, at best, incredibly sophisticated, very well-educated, but still inattentive, not likely to read any of these sort of contract terms that are given to them. And in the worst case, and that's who you more often uh, than not see really bearing the costs of some of these incredibly manipulative uh, financial products, you have less well-educated, less financially sophisticated consumers who are, in essence, being penalized for their lack of sophistication by being goaded into products that aren't right for them. And so in the aftermath of the crisis, we kind of, and Elizabeth Warren, to give her tremendous credit, was at the forefront of this fight 
kind of realized that we should and wrote a very influential law review article that basically was the precursor for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau with Oren Bargill in Penn Law Review, which is great news for me, um, wrote a very influential article where they essentially said, this isn't fair. This isn't fair. This isn't right. And what can we do better as regulators? And in the aftermath of the crisis, we did a lot in these markets. And kind of what I wanted my article to be is to take stock of where we had come, how far we had come since the crisis in a variety of different markets, and to try and learn some lessons that can think about how best to guide us in terms of uh, consumer financial regulation in particular going forward. And in essence, there is when you think about regulation in general, and when you think about consumer financial regulation in particular, there's always this debate that is going on about the existence or lack thereof of regulatory whack-a-mole. And the idea behind whack-a-mole, which is my favorite footnote in my paper, so I suggest everyone check it out. But the idea behind whack-a-mole is that it's an arcade game, and your your listeners probably all know this already. I didn't when I learned that I knew the term regulatory whack-a-mole. I did not know about the arcade game, <laughs> uh, but it's a game where there are a bunch of moles that come out of holes in the wall and kind of your job as the person playing the game is to hit as many moles as you can in a certain period of time and you get points for how many you hit. Every time you hit one, another mole comes out of another hole. And the reason this is like an apt analogy that some talk about in the context of regulation is the idea is that, again, you're dealing with really sophisticated firms. You are a regulator who's trying to do the best you can, or maybe not if you're sort of captured, but let's say you're trying to do the best you can, and you're kind of chasing after and saying, oh, that fee that you're thinking about charging is unfair to consumers. You can't charge that. Well, what a smart institution is going to do is be like, I want to make that money from that consumer. So I'm essentially going to have the identical fee. I'm just not going to call it the fee that you've chosen to regulate. And so I'm comporting with the text of the regulation that you've decided to institute, but not necessarily its spirit. And so a lot of people, even consumer advocates, so even people like Michael Barr at the time wrote a piece with Sendel Mullinathan and other co-authors where they said, we agree that penalty fees on consumer credit cards are way too high. It's just not obvious if you start regulating them, what kind of some of the unintended consequences might be, what other kinds of terms are going to go ahead and adjust as a result of your regulatory intervention. And on the other side, you had a bunch of non-academic types, more political types saying, yeah, but this is unfair. We have to do something. We have to act. And we need to come in and regulate these markets very forcefully. And we have to figure out a way to make them fairer for consumers. And so what I wanted to try and understand essentially in this article is when whack-a-mole does and doesn't occur. And what you come to is a really interesting set of facts, which is that sometimes you do see the kind of response that academics are nervous about, that banks suggest, or sophisticated financial firms are still going to take advantage of consumers in other ways. And other times you see no response by these sophisticated firms. And I actually think that the difference is quite informative about the kind of regulation that we can expect is going to deliver overall consumer benefits. And that's what I'm trying to understand in this piece. So in trying to understand that and trying to understand when whack-a-mole will, will happen, you had a, an interesting empirical strategy in, in this article in that you didn't look at just one intervention as a one-off. You looked at three unique interventions to try to draw some insights from the interaction of your empirical analyses from those interventions. Could you describe what your empirical strategy was, uh, what interventions you were looking at, and how you constructed your analysis? Yeah, absolutely. So kind of, I am, I was motivated in this whole inquiry by some work by Howell Jackson and John Campbell and Bridget Madrian and Peter Tufano, where they wrote about the need for much more aggressive consumer financial protection and said that kind of the number one task for academics and for policymakers in the aftermath of the crisis is to be really thoughtful about analyzing the expected consequences of interventions, but also the actual 
effects of regulation because that can teach us something about how to intervene going forward. And to that end, I actually, most academic work, I'm a financial economist by training, so most finance papers that are written on consumer finance tend to take a particular intervention, like one regulatory change, and look at it and say, what are essentially the consequences of this with much more sophisticated econometrics than I do in this paper? And that's what the consumer finance literature has been traditionally. The reason I wanted to do a little bit broader of an analysis is because while you can learn about the efficacy of one particular intervention and do it incredibly well, as many of the papers I cite to in this article do, without taking a bit of a more holistic approach to sort of the consumer finance regulatory project more generally, it's hard to draw broader inferences about how to intervene and what kind of policies work. And so if you just were to look at, for example, the CARD Act, you will see, which is one of the examples I look to in this paper. So I look at the CARD Act, which regulated the ability of card issuing banks to charge penalty fees, cap their penalty fees that they were able to charge to consumers for delinquencies. It also said that you weren't allowed as a card issuer to unexpectedly raise interest rates on your consumer. And it did a bunch of other things. Also, it tried to nudge consumers into early repayment. If you were to look at this intervention, as many very good papers have done, sort of the seminal paper on this is by Smit Agarwal uh, and Johannes Strobel and Neil Mahoney and Sufala Chusamet at the OCC. And their paper shows that what happens in response to the CARD Act is that CARD issuers are now bound. They don't make as much money in fee revenue from their consumers. And in essence, no other prices adjust to offset that loss. So overall, consumers are making around $12 billion annually from this intervention because they're paying lower fees. And and they look at this intervention and they compare it to what Michael Barr and Sendel Molinathan had said, saying that they're skeptical that these kind of interventions are sensible. And they say, well, actually, depending on the circumstances, depending on the nature of the market, what you see is that regulated financial institutions actually don't offset interventions. And so regulation can increase overall consumer welfare. And what's interesting is that sort of standalone piece of evidence might make you think that, oh, great, well, we can regulate all consumer finance markets in this way. We can sort of price regulate because the market particulars are such that banks aren't going to fully offset these losses. And so we can deliver welfare gains to consumers generally. And what you see when you compare, and that's what I do in this article, when you compare this intervention to something like the Durbin Amendment, the idea behind the Durbin Amendment was that every time you and I transact with a credit card or a debit card, the merchant has to pay a processing fee for processing that transaction to the bank who issues your card. And what the Durbin Amendment did is it said these fees have gotten out of control for a variety of reasons. People use these cards more, so these fees accrue on more transactions to merchants. And also, by the way, uh, merchants that are card networks have introduced rewards cards, which have especially high transaction fees. We need to do something we need to regulate here. And, you know, we're going to what we're going to do is we're going to cap these fees that merchants have to pay. And the result is going to be lower fees for merchants. It's going to be benefits to consumers because people pay lower prices since merchant fees have been decreased. And what you actually see is that this, just like the CARD Act, this is a price regulation, impacts the exact same financial firms, happens essentially at the exact same time as the CARD Act, and yet the result for consumers is totally different. So as a result of the Durbin Amendment, what happens is banks do offset those losses, the same banks that do not offset the losses from the CARD Act. They offset the losses from the Durbin Amendment, and the result is that consumers used to all get free checking accounts. 
Now for regulated banks, which are banks above the $10 billion threshold who are no subject to the Durban fee cap, now free checking has disappeared in essence. Only 20% of consumers still have access to a free checking account, which means a $0 monthly maintenance fee regardless of the account size. And that means that consumers overall, when you sort of do a bunch of welfare analysis like I do in the paper, overall consumers are losing about $2 billion annually from this intervention. So on the one hand, you have the CARD Act, same kind of regulation. Consumers are making $12 billion. On the other hand, you have this the Durban Amendment, regulated debit cards, not credit cards, but in essence is like a very similar intervention and consumers are losing money annually from it. And so what I think it's really important for us to understand and why I think it is actually a good exercise for us to compare the efficacy of different kinds of interventions is because it enables us to form some conclusion about the type of interventions that are most likely to be successful and why they're most likely to be successful. And in this paper, what I come to, I come to the conclusion that the kinds of price regulations that are most likely to help consumers are ones that tackle a particular behavioral problem that exists in consumer finance markets. So in the context of consumer credit, it's that consumers, when they're making a decision about what credit card they want, no one reads a 38-page credit card contract, so no one has any idea about the penalty fees that might accrue to them for delinquency. And by the way, even the people who might actually read the contract have no idea that they're actually going to ever be delinquent because people are overly optimistic and don't have a good sense of when actually they're going to end up bearing these fees. And so that is a behavioral limitation of consumers that for firms exploit by charging super high penalty fees. And the same thing is true in the third sort of case study I bring to bear in this paper, which is in the context of overdraft. Overdraft is a product that is designed, in essence, to exploit consumers' behavioral limitations, because when you're making a decision about what checking account you want, you think about, you know, is does the check, you actually think about, does the checking account have a monthly fee or is it a free checking account? And that's a salient term to you, the consumer, but the overdraft fee that's going to accrue to you for overdrawing on your account, like way down in the future, is not even going to sort of exist on your mind as you're making this decision. And that's another term that we actually see that banks are successfully exploiting in the absence of regulation. And where regulation, we're a change to the default rule that requires that banks opt you into overdraft protection before charging you any fees for overdraft, actually does have a really consequential effect. It lowers overdraft revenue for banks. And we don't see any evidence of the kind of offset you see in the context of Durban. In the, the article, you, you discuss the, the concept of salience as having a pretty powerful explanatory effect for, for these mixed results. Could you discuss that concept a little bit and, uh, and what it means in the consumer finance context? Absolutely. So the sort of way I think about salience from the perspective of a consumer is I think about consumer finance products as being kind of a bundle and that bundle as having different prices attached to it. So when you think about the consumer checking account, for example, in the context of overdraft, well, there's a monthly fee that sort of we pay attention to. It's salient to us. And then there's a bunch of add-on fees, things like check cashing fees or overdraft fees or out-of-network ATM fees. And these are fee terms that sort of don't register to consumers when they're making the initial decision about what kind of product they want. And so you might think that in a, let's say, let's assume that we are in a world that is perfectly competitive. And so I'm going to sort of synthesize some work that's been done by a quite important work that was done by Xavier Gebex and David Labson in 2006 in the Quarterly Journal of Economics around shrouded attributes. And so you may think that, you know, there is this bundle of price, there's this bundle of price terms, and let's imagine we're in a perfectly competitive world. Well, then what you're going to see is you're going to see that price is going to be equal to cost and sort of the nature of competition is going to force banks to lower 
all of their price terms to the particular cost of offering a certain aspect of that bundle. So there's going to be an ATM fee that's going to be the cost to the bank of having you use an out-of-network ATM. You're going to be charged a check cashing fee. That's the cost to the bank of uh, processing your check and the like. What is actually true in a world in which consumers only pay attention to certain aspects of the price bundle is that those aspects get reduced to a price below cost. Because you, the consumer, are going to go for the bank that gives you a $0 monthly maintenance via free checking account as they sell it, or that gives you a credit card with a 0% APR. And so because firms are driven, even in a perfectly competitive world, and it gets even more complicated when the world is not perfectly competitive as it never is, but even in a perfectly competitive world that creates a situation in which you are underpaying as a consumer for certain aspects of the bundle and overpaying for other aspects. And if you're the kind of consumer that accrues a lot of these add-on fees, well, then you get really hurt by this equilibrium because, sure, you get a free checking account, but you're sort of paying way tremendously in the non-salient prices that you don't pay attention to ex ante. And so the question for regulators, it's really easy ex post for me to tell you that oh, overdraft fees aren't salient to consumers or penalty fees on consumer credit cards aren't salient to consumers. So these are places where you're going to see financial institutions being really exploitative. The question that is much harder to answer is ex ante. How do you know what is and what isn't salient from the perspective of the consumer? And in the article, I offer some suggestions for the kinds of questions we might want to know the answer to that can help help us do salience targeting and intervene in markets to kind of correct salience problems. Uh, but overall, what I want to draw attention to for consumers and for academics who are also consumers and going to be the consumers of this piece is that the reason why we need a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the reason why we worry about consumers in these markets has everything to do with the lack of sophistication of consumers relative to financial firms and has to do with the fact that we know that these firms have every incentive to exploit every naive aspect of our sort of behavioral beings. And so our job as regulators is to think about the least assortive ways that we can kind of correct some of these behavioral problems, but it's an oversimplification to assume that these behavioral problems exist in every aspect of the banking relationship because they don't. And actually, that's what Durbin illustrates. Durbin is about regulating the relationship between the bank, who is sophisticated and profit maximizing and the like, and the merchant who is sophisticated and a merchant and is very aware that they are paying these fees. That's why there have been antitrust lawsuits dating back for decades about the existence of interchange and how collusive the card networks are in setting these fees and the like. And so there really isn't a behavioral problem in that particular relationship that's being solved by intervention. And that's why I hypothesize that you see a different response by banks because it's not like we're correcting a situation situation in which they're being super exploitative. It's like we're intervening in a relationship where there's this behavioral problem doesn't really exist. And so naturally, you see unintended consequences and distortions that are being created. A cross current in this article is the idea of cross subsidization between lower income folks and, and higher income folks. Could you discuss that a little bit and, and some of the policy options we might have? I one that kind of caught my eye was the suggestion that maybe we, we shouldn't have credit cards with loyalty points uh, associated with them. Absolutely. And so this is, I, I've almost been hiding the ball as we were talking because I talk a lot at, when I think about consumer finance, I think, and even the term consumer finance, right? And when you think about things like consumer welfare, it makes it sound like there are like, there is one consumer or consumers as a group are like a unit and we can think about them together. And that's kind of a sensible way to think about consumer financial regulation. And in reality, that's not at all the case. 
see varied overall efficacy of all these interventions, the one constant that I have seen in every single consumer finance market I have looked at, uh, and I'm spending a lot of time at the CFPB right now actually sort of doing exactly a version of this exercise in different markets that I didn't have a chance to touch on in this article, things like payday lending, things like cash-based underwriting. When you look at all of these markets, you see the existence of inequitable cross-subsidization, which means that less educated, less financially sophisticated, lower income people are paying more for financial products and more in general than their more sophisticated, wealthier counterparts. And a canonical example of this is you can look at the consumer credit card industry, okay? You can think about people like you and I who are transacting with American Express cards or with Chase Sapphire Reserve Rewards cards, and we're getting some kickback from Chase, from Amex for those transactions. We're getting airline miles. We're getting cash back. And then we are going to, and we're, that's why we're using those cards, by the way, when we go to the grocery store to buy a gallon of milk. When someone who is poor and doesn't have access to an American Express card or a Chase Reserve rewards card goes to buy a gallon of milk at the grocery store, they pay with cash. And they pay, we all pay the same amount for that gallon of milk. We pay $3 to buy a gallon of milk at the grocery store. And so the result is that your gallon of milk, you, the rewards card user, costs less to you than someone who pays with cash. And the person who pays with cash is subsidizing your retail purchase. And that is true in every consumer finance market. You think about overdraft. Overdraft for the longest time enabled large financial institutions to offer free checking accounts, which they wanted to do because that was how they encourage people to join their bank by sort of offering this very attractive, very salient product to consumers. And so you have a situation where there's a $0 fee for you and I who transact, who have a checking account with Bank of America, with Wells Fargo. And the reason we're able to have is it doesn't cost nothing for the bank to offer us that product. The reason they can offer us that product is from our friend who is less financially sophisticated, a college student who doesn't have that much money in their checking account, who's overdrafting 10 times a week, that's generating $350 for the bank. And they're kind of using that $350 from that consumer to offer you a free checking account product. And so part of what I think we need to think about as academics who are interested in consumer finance, but also as hopefully policymakers who are going to be involved in this discussion going forward, is how do we correct some of this inequitable cross-subsidization? And, you know, I laugh about this because this is the one thing when you talk to progressives who are very excited about how we think about consumer finance and how to make these markets fairer for consumers. If you tell them that your idea is we should get rid of credit card rewards, <laughs> everyone becomes much less sympathetic to your cause. But I actually think that it's not, I actually think in a general loyalty rewards programs do create inequitable cross subsidization. And one way to get rid of that, by the way, if you don't like the idea of just saying that Amex is no longer allowed to give people airline miles when they use Amex, to make their travel arrangements. A solution is to be much clearer than we have been historically, and this is sort of being litigated as we speak uh, and made its way up to the Supreme Court quite recently, but a solution is to say that merchants should at the very least be allowed to pass through the cost of processing those American Express cards, which can be like 4% of the transaction value, to consumers. And then consumers who use American Express cards have a choice. Do I want to pay an extra 4% and get my airline miles? Or do I want to transact with a different card that has a lower transaction fee from the merchant's perspective? And at least then you are sort of forcing the consumer who was causing the merchant to incur this higher fee to make a decision about whether that higher fee is worth it from their perspective to cover the rewards they're being offered. But what you won't have is the equilibrium we have now, which is that there are people, a subset of people who are benefiting 
from the existence of these cross subsidies and they're rich people and they're being subsidized by people who don't have any access to these really attractive financial products. And I think that's a first order problem in consumer finance. And I think that we don't think about it enough because of literally the term consumer finance implies that there is one kind of consumer. And we think a lot about overall welfare enhancement. I would actually be very excited about regulatory interventions that didn't deliver any overall welfare enhancement. It would be great if they did, but let's say they don't deliver any overall welfare enhancement. But what they do do is they address this inequitable cross-subsidization. So they basically make a group of consumers who have been paying too much for consumer finance products, who are disproportionately less sophisticated, bearing penalty fees and add-on shrouded costs and the like, and take those consumers and make it so they pay less and people who are more financially sophisticated sort of no longer benefit from this cross subsidy. And by the way, I think that that I think that that's fairer. I think that that is the world in which we all should want to reside. But I also think that that is I think that too often we paint an overly simplistic narrative. Like there is a group of really bad banks and they're taking advantage of consumers. When in reality, it's true that the banks are taking advantage of consumers, but what we don't necessarily think about is that the beneficiaries of that exploitation aren't just the banks, they're also sophisticated consumers. And it's not any fault of our own, it's just the nature of the equilibrium and kind of our job as regulators is to think about how best to intervene to correct some of these problems. In your article, uh, which is uh, on uh, SSRN, and I, I will include a link uh, to in the, the show notes, on page 48, you offer this kind of neat thing. Uh, it's called a summary of lessons, the three by three summary of the, the key takeaways uh, from the article. So I would encourage folks to take a look at that. Uh, but what, what are some takeaways that you might offer from this article, whether somebody listening is from a policy making standpoint or from uh, an academic standpoint? So I think the the big takeaways from the piece are threefold. So the first piece we got a chance to talk a lot about is that from regulatory perspective, what we should be thinking about from a policy perspective, from an academic perspective, we should be skeptical of the existence of non-salient price terms. So when there are pieces of a consumer financial product that it looks like are kind of dug into page 30 of a 38 credit card contract about the nature of the penalty fees or how interest rates will change uh, after the introductory period. And we kind of know that consumers aren't paying attention to those. Those are a good place for regulators to think about intervening. I mean, we talked a little bit about it, but a natural question is, how do you know that something is a non-salient price? And the suggestion that I have, it requires more academics to write papers, by the way, to say, oh, look, in this situation, in, in, in these situations, it's clear that this is kind of price above cost. That's kind of exploitative pricing that's being done by these firms. But one way to be attuned to this as policy folks is to say that, if there is a price term that it looks like is generating a lot of revenue for financial firms over time, and it's kind of growing over time in a way that seems to potentially indicate that this is a revenue source that is being relied on more heavily by the firm, that's a place to look to be a little skeptical. So overdraft is a good example in what happened in the early 2000s is banks transitioned from deciding about whether to allow you to overdraft a transaction sort of one at a time versus, and then a bunch of firms popped up to automate that process. And in fact, to encourage consumers to overdraft more frequently and overdraft revenue for banks exploded. And in these situations, that's where regulators should think about interventions, things like price regulation, but not just price regulation. There are other kinds of interventions that are going to work and that are going to be very successful in these markets. Because what we're dealing with is a salience problem. So if you're able to make something that is not salient to consumers salient to them, and I advocate, a sale, I call it a salience shock as kind of 
one of these interventions. Think about if you're about to overdraft, you have $2 left in your checking account and you're at Starbucks, you want to buy a latte. Well, if you got a text message from your bank saying that if you continue with that transaction, we're going to charge you $35 plus the cost of your $5 latte, it's $40 for your morning coffee, that will get you to rethink whether you want to make that costly mistake we think, from a consumer finance perspective. And that is a much more effective disclosure than telling consumers six months before when they signed up for their checking account that someday down the road, you might get hit with one of these fees. So I think the first lesson is we need to regulate salient prices. And one kind of regulation is a direct price regulation, which is what you see in the context of overdraft in the CARD Act. But another kind of regulation is taking things that aren't salient to consumers and making them salient in a timely, simple Simple manner where they're given the information they need to make a decision right before that decision needs to be made. That's my first big lesson. My second big lesson we also got to talk about is that there are lots of inequities in consumer finance markets that come from the relationship, the sort of asymmetry of bargaining power, the asymmetry of sophistication between consumers and firms as firms. And I think we need to pay attention to all of those. But I think we make a mistake by thinking about consumers as one general group rather than thinking about consumers as heterogeneous agents who are differentially disadvantaged by consumer financial markets. And particularly the least sophisticated, most financially vulnerable, poorest, uh, least educated people in our society are the ones who perversely pay the most for financial products. And that needs to be a first order line of inquiry for how to fix that problem for regulators and policymakers. And it's our job as sort of academics to draw much more attention to the existence of these inequities than has existed previously. And I have sort of court related work where I say that consumer finance should rely on UDAP authority to directly intervene in these markets because the existence of inequitable cross subsidization is unfair, at least to the class of consumers who's doing the subsidization. And the last piece that I have is a, just a general push for more academics to be engaged in more legal academics in particular, because legal academics have such strong command of how these institutions work and a lot of regulatory changes that have occurred over time. I think we need to be much more data and in I mean, I'm biased, but I think we need to focus much more on empirical analysis and be much more thoughtful about how we think about how regulatory interventions actually play out in practice versus ascribing too much value to what institutions say ex ante they are going to do in response to an intervention. Because in all of three of the cases that I study in this paper, you have exactly the same set of dialogues that occur when there's notice and comment rulemaking around any of these things. But every single bank says every single time that the consumer is going to pay for you intervening in this market. And the result is going to be that we don't serve consumers as well. And so you shouldn't do this. And they have every incentive to give us that narrative. What this article illustrates is that sometimes that's true and sometimes that's not true. And just being over-reliant on what the firms themselves say ex ante is going to paint a distorted picture of what the actual efficacy of regulation is. By the way, being overly attentive to a bunch of anecdotal evidence that is offered about the impact of different kinds of regulation. So there is quite actually famous work that's been done by Lauren uh, Willis on overdraft and Richard Pildes and Ryan Bubb on overdraft, where they take this overdraft intervention, which was a behavioral oriented intervention, where now we change the default rule so consumers can't be charged overdraft fees until we have actively been able to opt them in to overdraft protection programs. And they pronounced this intervention was a failure. And it, by the way, it's not only a failure, it's also sort of illustrative of the general failure of behavioral oriented regulation in these markets because, and they base this belief on the fact that there's a bunch of anecdotal evidence that for some banks, for some consumers, consumers are being aggressively pushed into opting in by very sophisticated financial firms who are really pushing them so much so that they eventually give up. They just change the default. And so the default rule isn't really quite sticky in this setting.
And what the data shows is that that might be true for some firms. It certainly is. What's true for other firms is that they are so attentive to that. They're so concerned about being seen as an overdraft gouger by their consumers and by regulators that they move even beyond what's required of them uh, by the opt-in rule change. And they eliminate overdraft on certain kinds of transactions entirely. And all that is a very long-winded way of saying that it is a mistake, just like it's a mistake to rely on what banks say ex ante they're going to do in response to regulation. It's a mistake to rely on what a few consumers or a few anecdotal pieces of evidence suggest the impact of a regulatory intervention was. And where that leaves us is if we want to do, as I think we all should, what Howell Jackson and Bridget Nadrian and Peter Tufano and John Campbell have challenged the academic community who cares about consumer finance to do, which is to analyze the efficacy of regulatory interventions, then there really is only one option for us. And it's to be heavily data driven and to be guided in our assessments by what the empirical evidence tells us. And that's the broadest lesson I hope that this article pushes forward is that it is the, the highest priority for those of us who care about policy oriented financial, any kind of research that we do to be really attentive to chasing down the right data that helps us answer the question. Because without it, we're left with partial answers and in policy being made with partial information is not going to be very effective policy. Our guest today has been Natasha Sarin, Assistant Professor of Law at the University of Pennsylvania School of Law and Assistant Professor of Finance at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. We've discussed her article, Making Consumer Finance Work, which is forthcoming in the Columbia Law Review. I'll add a link to that in the show notes for today's episode. Natasha, thank you for joining the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Andrew. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Business Scholarship Podcast. If you like what you heard, please consider subscribing to the podcast or leaving a rating on your favorite podcast app or let other people know about it too. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com and I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm your host, Andrew Jennings.